Well, good morning. Great to gather on a beautiful summer morning here in Minnesota. Uh, we are in the middle of a teaching series called Family of Origin. We're looking at uh, the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but then also tying that into our family situations. And when I think about the summer, I think about it as wedding season. And so maybe in your family, you have somebody who's engaged or somebody who's getting married this summer, and you think about how that changes family dynamics and the importance of finding the right person to spend the rest of your life with. We're going to explore that today as we look at Abraham and how he finds a wife for his son, Isaac. So let's stand, let's welcome each other to worship today, and then you can take a seat as we sing our opening hymn, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling. We gather glorying in the perfect love of the God who has loved us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Verse 2, I don't know if you caught the words, but it said, Take away the love of sinning. In our own hearts, we find ourselves drawn away from what God desires for us. And so scripture says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that we have a God who loves us, which means that even when we stray away, he seeks after us and he draws us back into his family. You are the family of God. God has drawn you here to worship today so that he can remind you of his promises, that as a child of God, you are loved, you are forgiven. Amen. We continue by singing our hymn of praise, This is the Feast. You may be seated as we turn to our scripture for the day. Today's Old Testament reading comes from selected verses of Genesis chapter 4, 24. To put it in context, we should reflect on chapter 23, where we learn that Sarah has died at the age of 107, 27. Abraham grieved. Isaac is approaching 40 years old. He doesn't have a wife. There are no grandchildren. 
and Abraham is approximately 140. In this day, it was common for marriages to be arranged by the parents, but again, Abraham was old, travel was difficult, and he did not want his son to marry a woman from Canaan because of differences in culture and values. So Abraham sends his trusted servant, Eliezer, to his home country of Ur, to Nahor, to find a wife for Isaac. And in the reading, please also note that the servant prayed for his task. He, the servant, said to Laban, who was Rebekah's uncle or brother, I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has blessed my master abundantly, and he has become wealthy. He has given him sheep and cattle, silver and gold, male and female servants, camels and donkeys. My master's wife, Sarah, has borne him a son in her old age, and he has given him everything he owns. And my master made me swear an oath and said, you must not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but go to my father's family and to my own clan and get a wife for my son. When I came to the spring today, I said, Lord, God of my master Abraham, if you will, please grant success to the journey on which I have come. See, I am standing beside the spring. If a young woman comes out to draw water and I say to her, please let me drink a little water from your jar. And if she says to me, drink, and I'll draw water for your camels also, let her be the one the Lord has chosen for my master's son. Before I finished praying in my heart, Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water, and I said to her, please give me a drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will water your camels too. So I drank, and she watered the camels also. I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, son of Nahor, who Milcah bore to him. Then I put a ring in her nose and bracelets on her arm. And I bowed down and worshiped the Lord, and I praised the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me on the right road to get the granddaughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you will show kindness and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, so I may know which way to return. So they called Rebekah and asked her, will you go with this man? I will go, she said. So they sent their sister Rebekah on her way, along with her nurse and Abraham's sister and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, our sister, may you increase to thousands upon thousands. May your offspring possess the cities of their enemies. Then Rebekah and her attendants got ready and mounted the camels and went back with the man. So the servant took Rebekah and left. Now Isaac had come from the land of Bir Lahiroi, for he was living in the Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebekah also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. This is the word of the Lord. We join in singing our sermon hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love that you have placed in our hearts and that desire to express that love and share that love, especially within the bounds of marriage. I thank you for all who are gathered here today who are married. And I, I pray especially for those who marriage is somewhere in their future, that the words that we take from Scripture today, that your words would guide and direct all of our relationships. In your name we pray. Amen. Everybody loves a good love story, right? Let me introduce you to David and Bethy Weinlich. Their love story begins 25 years ago, June 13th, 1998. See, this is their wedding day. But here's something interesting about their story. June 13th, 1998 is the first day that David and Bethy actually met each other. See, prior to their wedding day, they were complete strangers. I know it's a, it's a little bit of an unconventional love story. So, so here's a little bit of the backstory. David was a grad student at the University of Minnesota in the mid-1990s, and he's watching as family members and friends reach that eligible age for marrying, and, and there's a number of weddings that are happening, and people say to him, so when are you going to get married? And David's response was, June 13th, 1998. Somewhere in the future, that's when I'm getting married. And as that day crept closer and closer, there was a problem. He didn't have a bride. There was nobody for him to marry. So that's when one of his friends by the name of Steve Fletcher came up with this far-fetched plan. He said, you know what? We got to find you a wife. So why don't we approach this in the same way that we would a political campaign? Let's, let's do the advertising, do the marketing, say we're looking for a wife for you, and whoever wants to submit an application, they can actually campaign in order to become your bride. And the votes? Well, you gather together your closest family members and your closest friends, and we'll do the voting for you. And David's like, okay, <laughs> let's do it. So... They started their campaign, and they put out advertisements in the local newspaper, and they put a commercial on local TV here in the Twin Cities, and they invited people to apply. And Bethy was one of those young women who read the advertisement and thought, huh, I'm kind of intrigued. So she called her mom. Now, moms, I want you to put yourself in this position. Let's say your daughter calls you and says, so I saw this advertisement about a guy who wants to get married and I want a campaign to be his wife. Well, what do you think? I don't know if I could say this as a parent, but her mom said, might as well. Who knows? It might be the best love story yet unwritten. And so Bethy decides to put her name into the running and on June 13th, 1998, she shows up and she campaigns in order to become David's wife, and she's a runaway winner. And so in front of 2,000 people, right here in Minnesota at the Mall of America, David and Bethy got married. I know this is like a story of The Bachelor or The Bachelorette before any of those shows even existed. But we, we know how those shows tend to go. We know that those relationships don't last. And so some of you are a little bit skeptical, like, really? How long did this last? What if I told you that it actually worked? What if I told you that David and Bethy actually fell in love with each other, settled down here in Woodbury, Minnesota, and raised a family of four beautiful children? Until a few years ago, tragically, David passed away of colon cancer. It's an unconventional love story, but it worked. And today, as we continue through our teaching series, Family of Origin, we're going to look at another unconventional love story, at least unconventional by modern standards. 
And yet I think that there are some things that we can learn when it comes to all of us approaching our marriages. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 24, and here's the stage is set in the opening verses. Abraham was now very old. I think he's about 140 years old. And the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the senior servant in his household, elsewhere identified as Eliezer, the one in charge of all that he had, I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son. So here's what we see right away in the story. Abraham wants his son Isaac to marry the right woman. And parents and grandparents here today, you would echo that sentiment, right? I mean, as you're seeing these young people raised up, you want them to find the right person in order to spend their life with. This is what Abraham desires for Isaac. And now Isaac has reached this this age where he's probably the most eligible bachelor in Canaan at that time. He's incredibly wealthy. He's almost 40 years old. And yet, there's no bride. Why? Because all the girls around him are godless. And more than anything else, what matters is to have somebody who shares that same faith, who has those same values as you, And so Abraham goes to one of his servants and says, all right, we got to expand our search here a little bit. We're not finding any godly girls here locally. So the only place where I know that there are people who worship the same God as we do is my family, where we left them many, many years ago. So I want you to go back to my home country. It's about a 500-mile journey. And I want you to find a wife for my son, Isaac. And so he sets off on this journey. He loads up the camels. They're loaded down with all kinds of gifts, which he's hoping to use in order to pay the bride price, which is very, very common in the culture in those days, and to find someone who would be suitable for his son. And he gets to the town of Nahor, which is named after Abraham's brother. And he takes the camels after the long journey. He takes them to the well in town. And there's something significant about the well. This is the center of town. This is the hub where people gather. It's also the place where many people meet their future spouse. You know, if I ask people today, where did you meet your future spouse? Some people might say, oh, we met in school, we met in college, or maybe we met at a bar, or we met at a wedding, or maybe we met online. Those are all common places where we meet our spouses. But in the ancient world, one of the most common places was at a well. So Moses meets his wife, Zipporah, at a well. Later in Genesis, we'll see that Jacob meets his wife, Rachel, at a well. And so now we have the servant of Abraham who is at the well, which is a place where all of the eligible young bachelorettes in town come every day. He's there and he's hoping that he can find a suitable spouse for Isaac. And so what does he do? Verse 12, he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside the spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. You know, his prayer is really laying out some of the qualities, the qualifications that he's looking for in someone who is a suitable spouse for Isaac. He's looking for somebody who's kind. He's looking for somebody who's hospitable. He's looking for somebody who's generous. Why? Because those are the same character traits that he's witnessed back in the home of Abraham. He wants those values to be shared. And what happens? Verse 15, before he had even finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. The woman was very beautiful. 
a virgin. No man had ever slept with her. So she's an eligible bachelorette. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, this is the first test. Let's see how she responds. Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said. And then notice this word. And quickly she lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. She's checking the boxes. After she had given him a drink, she said, notice she's going above and beyond. I'll draw water for your camels too until they have enough to drink. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all his camels. (laughs) And then here's the servant. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. What does he see in Rebecca? He sees a woman who checks the boxes, not only of kindness and hospitality and generosity, but I want us to understand that this process of drawing water for the camels was a very extensive process. So a camel could drink up to 25 gallons of water. The jar that she had would carry about three gallons of water. And there were steps leading down to the spring or to the well. And so she has to go up and down, up and down, approximately 80 to 100 times in order to provide water for the camels. So not only is she kind, not only is she hospitable, not only is she generous, but she is a strong woman. And that's a desirable trait. And on top of that, it says she's beautiful. And she's also family. She's a second cousin to Isaac, which in our modern culture today, we'd be like, "Uh, no, that makes them ineligible. But in an ancient culture, it was common practice to marry somebody who was part of your extended family. And so the servant's like, she's the one. And he starts to load her down with all of these gifts, which was a a way in the ancient world of initiating the marriage proposal process. And Rebecca, she knows what's happening. She knows the offer that's being extended. And so she takes that next step and says, well, you better meet my family and talk to them about this. So she takes this servant back to meet her brother, to meet her father. They talk through the story. They're like, clearly God is in this. Let's talk to Rebecca. Rebecca, what do you want to do? And she says, I will go. Sight unseen, just like Bethy did. Sight unseen, I will go. I am willing to marry this man. And you get to the end of the story. And this is what it says in verse 67. And so Rebekah became Isaac's wife, and he loved her. It's an unconventional love story, because it's a love story that doesn't begin with love. Just like David and Bethy's story, it didn't begin with falling in love with each other. And yet within two days of being married, David said to his now bride, and he said, this is crazy to say, but... I'm beginning to fall in love with you. And here we see that with Rebecca and Isaac. It doesn't start with love. Sometimes a love story doesn't start with love, but every good love story ends with love. So where do we go with this? What is the takeaway for us in our modern context? I think as we look at this story, it's helpful simply to frame the different approaches that people take when it comes to marriage. And I think that in our context today, there tends to be two different approaches. There's the romantic approach, which is very common here in our American context, and that's where we choose who we're going to fall in love with and who we're going to propose to and who we're going to say yes to and who we're going to marry. And it's all about the two people getting married. But there's another approach, which is an arranged marriage approach, which is very common in other cultures in our world and also in ancient cultures, such as Isaac was a part of. And that's where the parents are the ones who play the dominant role. And the parents are the ones on the basis of social status or on the basis of shared values in the family. They're the ones who decide who their children are going to marry. 
So which one am I advocating for? Neither. I'm actually advocating for a third approach, which is a collaborative approach, one where you turn to and you rely on God in order to bring everybody together, and the parents and the children all have a say in that. Because I think that's actually what you see in this text this morning, is a collaborative approach, one where everybody gets a say. Abraham gets a say. Isaac gets a say. The servant Eliezer gets a say. Rebecca gets a say. Her father gets a say. Everybody gets a say. And as they approach this process, they're all relying on and they're leaning on God. From the very beginning where Abraham looks at all of the options in Canaan and says, there are no godly girls here. There's no good options to the point where the servant goes and he prays that the Lord would grant him success, to the response that's given by Rebecca's family. Clearly, God was the one who was orchestrating all of this. And even as Rebecca is coming home to meet Isaac for the first time, where is Isaac before he meets his wife? It says he's out in the field meditating. He's out in the field praying because he knows that there is so much riding on this decision that is being made. It's a collaborative approach. And so here's what this means for you. As parents and grandparents, you get a say. When it comes to who your child or grandchild marries, you actually get a say. And it begins here by praying for your child's future spouse. We were talking about that as a staff recently, about how many of us were blessed to grow up in homes where our parents not only told us that they were praying for our future spouses, but with us were praying for who that future spouse would be. And here's what's unique when it comes to praying for your child's future spouse, especially doing that with them, is you get a chance to lay out what those qualities are and what those qualifications are that make somebody a suitable spouse for them. So like as I talk with my girls who are getting older, I tell them, here's the type of man that I want you to marry. I want you to marry somebody who loves Jesus first and most, and I want you to find a man who's going to love you as much as I do. That's what I want, and that, that's a high standard to set. So as parents, we get an opportunity to weigh in and to let our kids know the type of person that we want them to marry. And then I would, I would say, all right, in all of this, what is the most important factor when it comes to who our children marry? What is the number one indicator of marital compatibility? It's this, godly friendship. It's not good looks, although that does play a role, and you look at this story and you see that Rebecca was beautiful, it mentions that. So it's not good looks. It's not a successful career, although you could look at the story and you could say Isaac was one of the most eligible bachelors in the ancient world. He was very successful. He was very wealthy. But those things come and go. The number one indicator of marital compatibility, though, is godly friendship. Are they somebody who has that deep relationship with the Lord and are they interesting do you enjoy spending time with them? And if you do, then pursue that relationship further. Proverbs 31 verse 30 says this, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Then to all of you who are here today and you're younger, you're teenagers, you're 20-somethings, you're beginning to think about marriage in the future someday. Here's what I would say to you. Meeting the family matters. So when you find that boy or that girl, that young man, that young woman who's meeting those qualifications and you're starting to fall in love with them, one of the things that you need to do is make sure that they meet the family. And this is kind of a throwback to a practice which was very common centuries ago, the practice of calling on someone. 
So if you were a young man and you were interested in another young woman, you went to her house, you knocked on the door, you introduced yourself to her family and you declared your intentions. And what would they do? They would invite you to come in, to have a meal with them, to spend time talking with them and getting to know them. It was none of this private stuff which leads to making out long before you ever should be and getting yourself in far too much trouble. It was all public. And it was collaborative, where you got a chance to see what that family system was. And I would just say to you, as young people, as you bring that significant other to meet your family, and if they begin to raise a caution flag and say, I don't know if this is the type of person that you should be with, and they are God-fearing, God-seeking family members, maybe, just maybe, you should pay attention to what they're saying because there's wisdom there. Because here's what I know. The second most important decision that you'll ever make is who to marry. First most important decision in your life is who you worship. Second most important decision is who you wed. First thing we need to figure out in our lives is we need to understand and seek after the heart of God. When the Bible talks about marriage, it actually uses marriage as a metaphor for our relationship with God. That is the first place where our hearts are settled, where we are settled in the love of God, receiving that, understanding that. And then out of that, the second most important decision we make is who we're going to wed, who we're going to spend the rest of our life with. Because what I know is that that person, whoever that person is, is going to influence so many of the decisions that you make. And those of you who are here today and you've been married for decades, you can echo that. You can say, that decision that I made years ago of who to marry has made such a big difference. And if you choose to marry somebody who's not godly, who's not seeking after the Lord in the same way that you are, they are going to slow you down in that. They are going to pull you away from that. And you're headed down a path that can lead to a very difficult marriage and possibly even divorce. Those are tough words to hear, but I say them because there's so much that is riding on our relationship choices. So may you see that the best love stories have Jesus at the center. Amen. Let's stand. With our relationship with God at the center, we join together in confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and descended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin, and look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
As we go to our Lord in prayer, after each petition, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and invite you to respond. Hear our prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of marriage, the gift of love. We thank you for uh, the marriages here at St. John's, those that are new, those that are long-lasting, those that are yet to come. And Lord, we pray. We pray for the next generation as they grow that they would, they would find godly girls, godly guys, that there would be godly homes that the next generation is raised in. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we know that it's, it's in that gift of marriage that you give children. And we thank you this weekend for the gift of Hadley Harms, daughter of Logan and Brianna, born this last week. We pray that you would continue to bless her as she grows. We also thank you later today for the baptism of Oliver Cook. We, we know, Lord, that you desire to have that relationship with us. And so we pray for that, for both Hadley and for Oliver and for their families. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we know that marriage is a gift until death parts us. And sometimes it's difficult to say goodbye to that, that person that we have loved so long. Today we remember the family of those who are grieving for the family especially of Dar Mondor and Joan Schwartz. Give them comfort and peace. Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> Heavenly Father, marriage is one where we make a commitment in sickness and in health. And we know that there are times where struggle comes, where hospitalizations come. Father, we thank you for family members who are there to support them in that time. Especially this week, Lord, we remember Jim and Dawn Burge, Wendy Gustin, she is hospitalized following some complications to surgery, Mary Lou Rogie, and others that we list in our bulletins as, as we have seen slow progress, sometimes no progress in health. And yet, Lord, we know that just because a prayer may not be answered the way that we expect and desire it to, does not mean that you are not still a faithful God. So be faithful to these, your people. Lord, in your mercy. Each of these prayers, then, Lord, we lift to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, as he's taught and invited us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This time we're going to sing our offertory as our offerings are brought forward.
remember our Lord Jesus Christ on the night when he was betrayed that he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said take and eat this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper we remember that he took the cup and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to them saying drink of it all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. There's a way that you can look at communion through the lens of marriage. Uh, in the ancient world, when it came to the proposal process, as the husband-to-be would make that proposal to his bride, he would take a cup and he would express his covenant commitment to her, to love her, to cherish her, till death parted them. And if she were to receive and accept that proposal, she would take that cup and drink of it herself. Jesus has proposed to you. Jesus has said, this is the depths to which I'm willing to go to sacrifice my life to spend it with you in eternity. And you're invited to come this morning and to receive that body, to receive that blood, to drink that cup, and to continue to faithfully worship him as you receive his love. So we're going to invite you in a moment to come forward after we sing the Agnus Day. We'll invite you to form two lines as you come down the center. You'll receive the bread from us as a pastoral team. The wine will be placed on the tables in front of you. And then you'll be able to discard your empty cups in the baskets as you return to your seats. So you may be seated as we sing our Agnus Day.
And now may this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you, keep you steadfast in the one true faith, to life everlasting. Live in his love. Amen. Then as we prepare to close our service today, we have an installation for Mr. Keith Traska as he steps into his role as principal. So Keith, I'm going to invite you to come forward. I'm going to invite your family to come forward as well. And then for all of you who are here today as staff members at St. John's, I'm going to invite you to come forward. Staff members can take a seat in the front. Keith's family can just stand around him. Um, We'll have you guys all face this way first. We'll have you turn in a moment. So I, I did ask Keith, I said, is there a verse, and we do this every time that there is an installation, is there a verse that defines your ministry, both what it has been and what it is moving forward? And Keith, you chose Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, and I'm glad you went back to verse 7 because we tend to do verse 9, but it's important to go back to verse 7, we'll explain that in a moment. So Joshua is stepping in into a new administrative role, which, uh, Keith, you've gone through administrative training. You just finished one year as an administrator, so you're a new administrator. And this is what God says to Joshua and what God says to us. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law that my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. So our success is contingent upon our obedience to God's word. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. We saw meditation in the story of Isaac as he's praying and trusting the Lord to lead him forward so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Because there will be that temptation in ministry to focus on the fears that are there, the discouraging times that happen. But here's the promise. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Keith, your stepdad, who I know played such a pivotal role in your life and raising you to be the man that you are, the last words that he said before he passed away to you is, don't ever compromise on what you know is right. That's what God says to Joshua. So I ask you, in the presence of God in this church, do you promise to carry out the responsibilities that have been assigned to you to the best of your abilities in accordance with the word of God and the teachings of the Lutheran church? And say, I will with God's help. And then to you as the congregation, every leader needs to know that they have a support network around them. So, having heard the promises that Keith has made before God and in your presence, are you willing to support his work, both in prayer and personal involvement, so that his work is a joy and not a burden? If so, say, we will, with the help of God. We will, with the help of God. Then, I welcome you to the ministry team here at St. John's, and I challenge you, and I know you're up for the challenge, I challenge you to the task set before you, and I install you as the next principal here at St. John's in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this time I'm gonna invite some of the staff then to gather around this family, pick a shoulder to lay a hand on, pick a head to lay a hand on, and uh, let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing this family here to Carver County, to St. John's, a place where they can call home, a place where they can be loved and accepted and welcomed, and a place where they can use the gifts that you have given to them collectively as a family to serve in this community, to serve the children, to serve the parents, to serve those who are currently here at St. John's and those who are yet to be here but will be here in the years to come. Lord, I pray that you would give Keith strength and courage, that you would give him an unwavering commitment to your word as he does what he knows is right in your sight. And Lord, in that, may you grant him and us and ultimately your kingdom success. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Then, staff, you can return to your seats, because I don't need to introduce you, but the rest of you can turn around for just a moment.
and introduce you to the Traska family. Um, they're not strangers here. In fact, they were actually in church today sitting next to family because Kay's aunt is Deb Klostermeyer. So Carver County has a fond place in their hearts. Keith has served for a couple of years as a teacher up at Mayer until the Lord was stirring in his heart to lead him the administrative principal route. And now he's here at St. John's. So Keith and Kay, and then from youngest to oldest, we've got Zion going into sixth grade. Petra starting high school at Mayer this year as a freshman and Stryker wrapping up his high school career as a senior. So give a warm welcome to the Traskas. And we'll let you guys return to your seats. Uh, Keith is a name guy, kind of like somebody that I know. So he, he likes to learn names and you'll have an opportunity to introduce yourself to the family. There is a cake reception after the service. Uh, they're going to be there. So um, we look forward to giving you the opportunity to connect with them more and to the things that God has in store for us in ministry together. So as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you now and always his peace. Amen. Our closing song this morning, uh, this is appropriate having just had in installation, but also in light of the discussion today about marriage, uh, because there's a hymn in our hymnal that has a marriage verse attached to it. It's, Go my children with my blessing, and that'll be the final verse of the hymn focused on marriage. And I just want you, as you sing that, maybe to sing that over somebody in your life who is thinking about marriage, who is new entering into marriage, or maybe you're singing it over your marriage of 50 some years. You're like, this is the desire that is still in my heart, that we would have the Lord's blessing and the Lord's love hovering over us. So let's close with Go My Children With My Blessing. Thank you.